Hello, friends. Welcome to Chickenlandia and welcome to Bok Talk, your 100% friendly backyard chickens show. I just, I don't know if you could see, I was just trying to adjust the camera because no matter what I do and how much moving around I do before I get started, and I do a lot of that, you can still see the U-Haul boxes. <laughs> so it's going to be like, I'm just, I'm just letting you guys know it's going to be months. It's going to be months before those things find their way to where they're supposed to go. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad you guys are here joining me today. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about preventing frostbite in chickens. And I know that a lot of you are interested in hearing about what you can do to prevent frostbite, because for many of you, this is your first winter uh, coming up with chickens. And so this is a big question that I get every year and we're going to talk about it. And I also have a question that was submitted by a listener. So I'm going to, I'm going to be answering that. And remember, if you have a question that you would like to submit to Bok Talk, you can go to my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com, go to the contact section, and then you'll see a little drop down menu and it'll say, ask a chicken question. So go there Submit your question. I absolutely love getting questions from you guys. I love hearing from you guys. Just a reminder, I cannot answer every question. And I really wish I could. And I used to, but I can't do it anymore. It's just I get the volume of questions I get is just too much. So if you have like something really serious going on, um, you know, please, I'm really sorry if I don't get back to you right away because it just doesn't happen sometimes. And sometimes I get really sad messages from people that are in an emergency situation. And I just, uh, I try, but I can't always answer those questions. Um, and, and certainly not in a timely manner, but I do my best. So I have two announcements today before we get started. First, as always, I want you to let, I want to let you know that this podcast was brought to you by my favorite chicken. My favorite chicken is my favorite one-stop online shop to get my feed, including scratch and peck feed, which I love, my chicken supplies, my fun chicken stuff. If you get a chance, check it out, myfavoritechicken.com. It's Chickenlandia's favorite spot for chicken things. Uh, the second announcement I want to make is just a reminder if you have not heard, I have an online course. It is called Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. That includes you. Uh, it's the perfect gift for the aspiring chicken person in your life or the chicken person who already has everything and just wants to up their chicken game. Um, you can check it out at course.welcometochickenlandia.com. You can also get to the course page from my website. There's a there's a um, tab that says course. So you can check that out. And I hope to see you guys there. There's an interactive part of it where I answer questions. And those questions we get to very quickly. Um, they, they are definitely on the top of the uh, priority list. So when we get a question through the course, we try to get to them quickly. And it will either be me or another course administrator our uh, presidential Chickenlandia, uh, our Chickenlandia presidential advisor, Kelsey, is also there answering questions. So it is time. Guess what? I'm doing this in every podcast now. It is a uh, time, the time in my podcast where I share a chicken story or a funny message from a listener. And this one is kind of a story, but um, it's really adorable. So and it made me laugh. So I'm going to share it with you guys. It's from a fan that is all the way across the world. So here it is. Hi, I am Nepun Malik. I am a 12 year old from India. My kid, my son is 12. My son is 12. So that's cool. My dad has recently purchased a farm of 13 acres in Delhi. It is walking distance from my house so I can check on my future chickens daily. I like, the, I like the way you think. You're thinking about the future. I am a first timer, so please suggest whether I should get full grown hens or cute little baby chicks. Also, please tell me how many minimum hens I should get for one rooster. I love your videos. Thank you for all the help you have given me. 
your number one fan and biggest follower, uh, Nepun Malik. P.S. Please give some tips. <laughs> please, please give some tips on how to convince my dad for chickens. Whenever I bring up the topic, he starts talking about something else. <laughs> Okay, so that made me laugh. That made me laugh, Nipun. Um, very funny. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sorry that your dad keeps changing the subject. Uh, I hope that he comes around. Maybe you just need to keep bringing it up and, you know, tell him that the chicken president is 100% on board. As long as you feel good and you feel like you can care for them properly, then I'm I'm on your team as far as you getting chickens. Um as for whether you should get baby chicks or adult hens, um, it is, it's easier, obviously, to make sure that you have hens, the right amount of hens per rooster if you get a, a, adult chickens. Um, and, you know, what I recommend is that you have at least, and this, this differs by breed and by rooster personality, but generally eight hens per rooster is a good ratio. Um, and, but then, you know, the advantage of getting baby chicks is that they're baby chicks and they're cute and they're, you know, you get to handle them a lot. They get more tame and they're more like pets to you. So you, you would probably really enjoy that. Um, just know that they require more specialized care. So it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to really keep an eye on them, especially if they're on another property, it's going to take work to do that. Um, and that you would need to have a plan for extra roosters if you don't have a way of getting all female chicks. So, uh, thank you. Best of luck to you. And thank you so much for your message. And, um, you know, I'm rooting for you in your quest, in your chicken quest. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, before we get started on the question, I'm just going to say hello to some of the people in the chat because I keep forgetting to do that. And Day Morris is here. Thank you so much for being here. Janessa09, Aretta, uh, not going to pronounce your last name because I'm going to mess it up. Thank you for being here. Loy is very is here. Oh, uh, thank you. I love glasses. I have a thing about glasses. <laughs> Henry Brusak is here. Thank you for being here. Fluffernut Farms, Ur Herb Urban Homestead. Wow, there's a lot of people here. I can't say hi to everybody. <laughs> I'll just be here all day. <laughs> Celia Perry, Rhiannon. Yay, Rhiannon. Sorry. Uh, Kiss My Grass is here. Yay. Thank you guys so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Okay, so let's talk about frostbite. Here is a question I got from a, a listener. Her name is Wendy. And she asked, does applying petroleum jelly to combs and wattles help to keep my hens free of frostbite? Winter is here. The temperatures are mostly 20s and 30s, but we can get the occasional day where we have 0 to 15. That sounds a lot like the climate that I'm in, um, although it's very wet here, so I don't know what, what it's like where you are. Is there anything else we can do? We have put plastic panels around most of the runs to keep the wind out, uh, the wind, snow, and rain out. Thank you. Okay, so so yeah, I mean, I mean, it, this might be a non-issue for you. It depends on on your climate. The amount of moisture that gets into your coop is really that's really like the key factor. But hopefully it won't be a problem. Um, and it also depends on the kind of breeds that you have. Um, but the number one thing that you will have to do is keep your coop dry. Uh, in the winter, moisture is more of an issue than, than low temperatures will ever be. Uh, condensation is an issue, especially when it comes to frostbite. So we're going to talk about that more in a minute. In the meantime, obviously have Cold hardy breeds. Uh, that is very important. Generally, uh, the cold hardy breeds, there's some exceptions, but most of them have like smaller combs and wattles. So they're just not as vulnerable to frostbite. The, obviously, the larger the comb, like the, if you have that big floppy comb and big old waddle, wattles, that makes them more uh, susceptible to frostbite. And that's why roosters get it more often than hens do. Um, 
and honestly, you know, I've, I've heard mixed reviews about the Vaseline thing. Um, and you can put, you know, you can put petroleum jelly on you and you can put it on the comb and waddles. You can put, I know some people will put coconut oil, um, or another natural alternative to petroleum jelly. But basically what you're doing is you're just creating a barrier. Um, so that, that, you know, that cold moisture doesn't get there and cause frostbite. And, you know, some people say it does nothing and some people swear by it, but as with anything, it really, there's so many factors that would go into whether, you know, how well this would work. And a lot of it just has to do with the climate that you're in, the environment that you're in, the kind of coop that you have. So the direction I lean in is that if you are able to do it, and it's not like, you know, I mean, obviously if you have 50 chickens, it's going to be tough to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, maybe you would find the ones just with the big combs and waddles and, and put it on them. But if you're able to do that, it's not going to hurt them. And I do lean in the direction of it helping them. So if you're, if you're worried about it, I would go ahead and do it. And hopefully that will help. Um, you know, like I said, it's more important than anything else is the moisture in your coop. So the way to control moisture is to make sure that you have good ventilation. And the issue, especially with new chicken keepers, is that... <laughs> um, Sorry, I got distracted by the emojis. <laughs> the issue with chicken keepers is that that's really counterintuitive for them. They really feel like, oh, I need to seal up every nook and cranny. I need to close all the windows. I need to, you know, make sure that the heat stays in the coop. But that is really a recipe for, you know, unsavory things happening because really chickens, they create chickens themselves just through their breath. They create moisture. Uh, at night when they're breathing, they create moisture. Their droppings create moisture. If you have a waterer in the coop, which I don't actually recommend, but if you do have a waterer in the coop, that will create moisture. If you have ducks living with your chickens, that absolutely will create moisture. So what you want to do is keep the airflow in your coop and you want there to be some nice cross ventilation. Now, what you need to be mindful of is that you're not creating drafts where your chickens roost. You don't want them to be, you know, them to be exposed to these heavy drafts all night and they're just getting too cold. So basically, you know, the, what most people do is they will put, ventilation above the roost, above where they're roosting. And if you can put it on both sides so that you get cross ventilation going, that's good. Hold on. I got to turn this. Um, the amount of ventilation that you're going to need will vary. It depends. Like I said, it always depends on your climate. Um, but a good rule of thumb is a half inch of ventilation per square foot of your coop space. Um, and make sure that you cover your ventilation holes with hardware mesh or, or some other type of wiring because you'd be surprised how predators, especially rats, how they can literally climb up walls and get into your coop. And they can get into like really small nooks and crannies and really small spaces. So you don't want that. You don't want critters in your coop, especially in winter, because they're looking for a nice dry place, warm place that might even have, I mean, if it has chicken feet in it, that's even better or chickens if they're looking for that. Um, so you don't want that. You want to deter them and make sure that you keep them out of their coop. So I do get questions about supplemental heat. And basically what you will find when you talk to people, when you talk to chicken enthusiasts in general, most people will tell you that there is never a reason to, uh, to put supplemental heat in your coop. But 
Uh, my observation is that there are so many different circumstances when it comes to people and their chickens. And there's people in all kinds of different climates that are keeping chickens. So it's just not that cut and dry. And though it is very rare for you to need to use supplemental heat in your coop, there are possible situations where you need to do it and it could possibly prevent frostbite. So here are the situations where you might, might need to use supplemental heat. If you have super fancy chickens, <laughs> super fancy, uh, you know, rare breeds that are not heat hardy, you might need to use supplemental heat depending on how cold it gets where you live. If you have very young chickens, like newly feathered chickens that have not been acclimated to the outside and the temperature get, or temperatures are getting below 50 outside at night, you might have to use supplemental heat while you're transitioning them slowly, acclimating, acclimating them to the weather outside. And usually by 12 weeks, they're definitely good to be outside without supplemental heat. But there, you know, you can't just, if there's a chicken that has a baby chick that is just fully feathered and not spent any time outside, you can't just throw them outside. You will end up with chicken you don't want. If you have really old or special needs chickens, you might need to offer supplemental heat. I have very old chickens and I also have special needs chickens. And I also have some fancy chickens, some funny little chickens in there. So I'm, you know, I don't know yet what this winter is going to bring. Um, I'm in a new area with a different climate from where I had, you know, even though I live in the same state and then in the same city, basically, although I'm in the county, um, it's different. It, there's a lot more moisture where I am right now, actually. So that's a new experience for me. And so right now I'm just kind of figuring out what I need to do. Um, if you live in an area where there are extended periods of below zero temperatures that below negative 15, or if there's like a huge sudden drop in temperature, then you might consider some safe supplemental heat. Um, and certainly if you're having repeated problems with frostbite and respiratory problems, you know, ammonia buildup that you're just really, really struggling with, you might consider if you have, if you have ammonia, you got to clean your coop. But if you're just like fighting it and fighting it and fighting it, you might consider safe supplemental heat. Now it is a, an investment and you know, I'm always talking about trying to keep things accessible for chicken keepers. Sometimes you can find these things used. So keep that in mind. Um, there are uh, heaters that are made specifically for chicken coops. And there's one called sweeter heater. I'm not sponsored by these companies, but if you're listening, I'm here. <laughs> there's one called sweeter heater. There's another called cozy coop. And then there's also, I don't know the brands, but there's also like pads that you can use. And it depends on the, the design of your coop, what you want to get. The cozy coop is cheaper and the pads are cheaper. The sweeter heater is, is, is more high end. Um, but these are made for chicken coops and they're so much more safe than a heat lamp. And, um, I always say, I hate speaking against heat lamps because they're cheap and they're accessible, but they are a fire hazard. So if there's a way that you can avoid it, I would try to avoid that. Um, if you absolutely feel like you must use it, you need to secure it better than you've ever secured anything in your life. <laughs> and make sure it stays clean uh, because they can ignite just from like a lot of dust and chicken coops can get really, really dusty and they get the, the heat lamps get really hot. The heaters, they don't get hot. hot. You know, the, the, the heaters that are especially for chickens, um, for chicken coops, they don't get hot like that. So um, it's not my job to tell you what to do and every situation is different, but I just, I want you to have the information <laughs> So, uh, Wendy, I hope that answers some of your questions. Uh, you can, I know somebody was asking about whether or not you can put Vaseline on their feet and you can do that too, uh, on their legs and feet, because sometimes if it's really severe, they might get frostbite on their feet. 
um, or their legs. And, you know, generally it's not, it's not going to kill a chicken to get frostbite, but obviously it's not a comfortable situation. Um, so it's definitely something that you want to avoid. And I think just, you know, avoidance is the best way to go. <laughs> like don't have, you don't have to deal with it in the first place. You can just prevent it and then you don't have to worry about it. So I hope that this gives you, um, some tips for the winter. You know, I do have a video, gosh, what is it called? How to keep chickens alive in winter. I think that's what it's called. <laughs> I didn't get dramatic with that or anything, uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's like, I mean, you know, you want to keep them alive. Um, and I will put that in the description and in the show notes for you. I think it's a really informative video to help make you feel better about, you know, just getting your chickens through the winter. And it's honestly like in general, depending on the breeds that you have, winter is easier for chickens than really hot summers. Like hot summers is when it really starts to get dangerous. So, um, and there's things that you can do, do then. So, um, don't worry, you got this. And I hope that now you have some good information to go forward and in, into the winter. So thank you, Wendy, for your question. Okay. Hold on. Let me get a drink here. I don't think I have a moderator today. <laughs> do I? Do I have a moderator today? I do not. Okay. Oh, well. Oh, that's good. Our urban homestead, we says, you know, we get negative 30 temps here and all I do is wrap my run with tarps. Not pretty, but it works. Yeah. You know, whatever works, do it. Um, and Celia says, my girls hate the summer. They much prefer the fall and winter. Yeah. Yeah. We had a really hot uh, summer this year. Like we actually lost two big trees on our property. They were alive when we moved here, um, but they died. Like we had about a week of really high temperatures and we we're just, I mean, like high for here is like 95 or a hundred degrees. You know, that's really hot for here. And so we had an extended period of that and we had two evergreen trees and one of them was big, a big tree and it died. And we just noticed yesterday and it was like, ugh. anyway. Okay. I am now going to open the chat for questions. If you have a question that you want to ask me, can you please post it in all capital letters so I can see it with my progressive lenses. <laughs> um, yeah. J write it in all caps because, um, I, the chat, just so you know, the chat goes really fast and sometimes it's hard for me to see. And there's a lot of people here right now. So Genesa, <laughs> Genesa09 asks, how is Chickenlandia doing? Chickenlandia is very busy, very busy right now. I am heading into the um, editing phase of the book. So I'm working with the publishing company and we're editing the book. So we're very busy. And, you know, I have been posting videos again. I'm doing these lives and um, turning them into podcasts. So we are extremely busy here. Obviously so busy that I can't unpack <laughs> You know, and then of course, you know, I've got like kids and t t a million dogs and <laughs> and chickens and ducks. And so, uh, Lori Anderson asks if a chicken gets frostbite, will the frostbite fall off? It, it will, uh, sometimes. And even if like, if it's really severe, um, I have seen chickens like lose their feet. Uh, so that would not, not a good situation. So that's why I always, say, you know, it's better to, um, prevent it than have to deal with it. Um, you know, if you do have a chicken with frostbite, it's best. There's in some cases where you might want to put some ointment on it, but you don't, you, you just want to be really careful. You don't want to rub it or anything because it can damage the frostbite is actually, it, it can, it can, you know, there might be tissue underneath that gets damaged. So you don't want to do that. 
um, I would bring them inside and do, you know, do the rest method on them. I'll post that in the description and in the show notes. It's just a, a protocol that you follow if you have a sick chicken or a chicken in shock or a chicken with frostbite. The main thing is when your chicken gets frostbite, you do not want them to get frostbite again because uh, that can really injure them and be super painful for them. So if you have a chicken that has frostbite, you need to take precautions that they don't get it again, you know, and it's possible that you will need to keep them inside um, or offer supplemental heat so that it doesn't happen. Again, you don't want it to happen again. That was a good question though. Just waiting for some more questions. Henry Bresak has a question. Does drinking cold water harm or not water the water heater? Okay, so I'm not completely understanding what you're asking. Like, um... Is it bad for them to drink cold water? Is that what you're asking? Is it bad for chickens to drink cold water? Or should you use, I think you're asking if you should use a water heater. I think if you can, like well, what I have in the chicken yard is um, I have dog bowl. I have dog bowls, heated dog bowls. And I use that because I have ducks and so the ducks really need to be able to immerse their, their beak and face in the water. So that's why I have open waterers. You have to clean them more, but that's, that's what I use. Um, but there are other types of chicken waterers. There's the nipple waterers that you can use that um, can be heated. And then there's the, there's like the other, uh, kind of fountain type waters that are made specifically for chickens that can be heated. Um, I know that some people make their, their own heaters for the coop and, I, but I kind of, I worry about, um, I just worry about fire hazard for that. It's probably fine, but I worry a little bit about that. Um, so I do use, what in the world do I have? It's something on my glasses. Sorry. I actually, I think I have something on my eye. <laughs> Yeah, like fuzz on my eye. There we go. Uh, I don't know how that got there. Um, so yeah, I think for me, the easiest thing is just the the open dog bowl uh, heaters, the waterers, heated waterers. Um, and I also use a dog heated waterer to put my fermented feed in in the winter if it's freezing because if you're fermenting feed and it's getting below zero and your or if it's getting below freezing and your waterers are freezing, your feed is going to freeze. And that's just uncomfortable for chickens. They will drink cold water. And, you know, before I got the heaters, before I got, before I had electricity uh, in my chicken yard, which I didn't have for a few years, um, number one, it was a horrible pain. Like I really hated it. <laughs> It made winter horrible. And number two, like the chickens would be drinking cold water. And I just, I definitely think it's more comfortable for them to have. And it doesn't make the water hot. The, the heaters don't make the water hot. They just keep them from freezing. Um, so I think it is better for them not to have super cold water in the, in the winter. But one way, you know, the way that I dealt with freezing waterers is I just had to go outside several times a day and and break the ice up and put new water into their waterers. And uh, you can imagine that's a real pain. So uh, my vote is for heated uh, waterers if you can swing it. Our urban homestead asks, one of my chickens is just now molting. Everyone else is done. Will this harm her? Um, I don't think it will harm her. If it's really cold, you might, this, this could be, you know, one of those circumstances where I would consider her special needs if she's like, has no feathers, like, cause some chickens, they just molt really fast. And certainly if they're good layers, it seems like 
they molt faster. Um, so if she's just like bald and it's in the dead of winter, I might consider her bringing her inside and I would just give her, you know, some extra nutrition. I, if you, if you can, you can give them, you can give all of them a two week course of vitamins, electrolytes, and probiotics. And you can just get those packs at, you know, the farm store. Um, and, or you can, uh, and you can give them a little bit of extra protein. I like to give them just, you know, leftover scrambled eggs from breakfast. Uh, you can give them mealworms or grubs if you want to buy them treats. Um, don't go super overboard with the protein because a lot of people will do that. Um, because that can give them, that can mess up their digestion. So you don't want that, but a little bit of extra protein is a good boost for them when they're molting, but it's, she's going to be okay. Just keep an eye on her and do the rest method. If you need to, if you, if she seems off or if she's just having a really tough time, bring her in, give her a little bit of TLC and make sure that, that she's doing okay. Uh, Hamilton Matthew says, what should I give my chicken when their poops are whitish color? Um, you know, that could be normal. Um, certainly white in, in poop is, is normal, um, in many circumstances. If they're having like super runny poops, um, and it, you're thinking that something's wrong, then it's, you know, it could be so many things. It could be so many things. It could be infection, internal infection. Um, it could be um, parasite problem. I would do, you know, like when in doubt, do the rest method. And basically all that is, is you're bringing them inside. You're giving them a little bit of treats. You're making sure that you're, that they're not having to work to say, to stay warm or cold. Um, and just keeping an eye on them. And I'm going to put that, I'll put that video, um, in the description and in the show notes. So Celia Perry asks, is it a good idea to offer hot oatmeal to chickens during cold days throughout the winter? So I would definitely not give them something hot. Um, you can give them something warm, if you want to do, I would make it, you know, pretty watery. If you want to do some oatmeal occasionally, uh, I don't think there's any harm in that. And, and of course they will love it. Uh, I wouldn't put any sweetener in it or anything like that. Just straight oatmeal. Um, the problem with oatmeal is that it is binding. So it is possible that you could create a situation where, uh, they get uh, constipated and it, mess it, it messes with their digestive system. So you don't want that. What I do in the winter rather than doing the oatmeal thing is I give them their fermented feed in the heated water bowl. And, and they love that. And it's warm and it's nourishing and it, it's their feed. So to me, like I prefer to do that. Um, and even if you don't ferment all the time, you can just get mash. You can just make wet mash and put it in the in a heated water bowl and give it to them or warm it up a little bit and give it to them. Um, the thing about, the other thing about oatmeal, and I had a friend that did this. She gave her chickens, you know, it was night, it was, it was roosting time. And so she was like, oh, I really want my chickens to be warm. So she gave her chickens oatmeal and it was, it was wet, you know, it was, it was watery because she didn't want them to, it to be binding. But that also creates this other problem where they're, and even if it's not too watery, it like it gets on their face. So she had all these chickens that went to bed that night with oatmeal on their face and with oatmeal on their, on their waddles and on their combs and they got frostbite. So that is something that you need to be aware of. Um, like I said, I like to just give them their feed and I give that to them in the morning and at night I'll give them a dry, you know, the way that I do fermented feed. And even if you're feeding it as a treat or whatever, is I give it to them in the morning as much as they will finish by the afternoon. 
uh, because I don't want fermented feeds sitting sitting around, and that's what that's what I do. Um, that I, you know, when you leave fermented feed out, it's, and you you know you fermented it and it's ready to be eaten that day, and that's really how you should make it, where it's like you have a batch ready for that day to be eaten that day. Um, but if you leave it out, you're just asking for little rodents to come around and get that delicious food. Like they just love that. Um, so then at night I will give my chickens a treat that is high in fat, has not super high, but has fat, protein, and carbohydrates in it. And that will, you know, kind of keep their, their, uh, their engines running at night and help to keep them warm. And some people will do cracked corn. Um, I will do like grubs and sunflower seeds or something like that. Okay. I hope that answers your question. I am going to answer one more question. And uh, let's see. Oops. I got, sorry, I got a little lost there. Hold on, guys. Since I don't have a moderator, I'm just like, <laughs> where am I? I think I'll give my chickens dry feed until spring. It makes sense. You know, it's harder in the winter to deal with fermented feed, I, I confess. And I might, I've been thinking about switching them to, uh, to, dry feed because scratch and peck has one that has, I was talking about this last week. Scratch and peck now has one that ha has grubs as protein and it's a really good feed. Um, so I've been thinking about trying that, but I think my chickens are going to get really mad at me. <laughs> okay. Our last question is, Oh God, I just had it and now I lost it. From Aretta, how much heat for the babies? Okay. So I get asked this question a lot. And what I will say is that it is better for you rather than like having a thermometer and keeping a thermometer and, and, you know, just checking the temperature all the time. It is better for you to observe the behavior of your baby chicks and to make sure that they're comfortable. So if you like, let's say you're using a heat lamp, if you, if you have, you know, there's brooders, um, with that have, um, there, they have panel heaters and with that, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you're using a heat lamp and you have baby chicks, uh, if they are all huddle, huddled under the heat lamp and they're kind of like getting on top of each other and they're peeping loudly, they are too cold and you need to lower the heat lamp a little bit until they're, until they appear, you know, like they're happy. If they are lined up around the sides of the brooder and it looks like they're trying to get away from the heat lamp and they seem kind of lethargic, they are too hot and that's super dangerous for them. So um, that means that you need to raise the heat lamp a little bit so that they can get away from it. They can they they don't have like so much. You don't want like blaring heat on them all the time because that can be dangerous for them. What you want is for some baby chicks to be under the heat lamp sleeping, some to be pecking and scratching, some to be eating. You don't want to put their their um, water or heat at waters or feeders underneath the heat lamp because you don't want those things to get hot. So those should be a little bit away from the heat, and uh, you will hear them peeping and making little noises. And maybe when they see you, they'll make noises or whatever. But you don't hear that like distressed call. Um, and it's it's very distinct. Like you will you will know like okay that that's a sign of distress. That's a baby chick calling. What 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 they're doing is calling, trying to call their mom, which is you. So and they're saying you know I'm I'm suffering something. I don't like this. I'm not comfortable. So if that's happening, you need to make adjustments. But if they're too hot, they might not be making much sound at all. So, you know, baby chicks being too hot or too cold can cause problems that can give them pasty butt, 
It can stress them out, which can lead to other situations. So it's good to just keep an eye on them. And if you want to, I do have a, a video about that. I will put that in the description um, and in the show notes for you. So you can check that out. I just need a little bit of time once this posts to put that on there. Okay, guys, I know there's probably some more questions that I missed, but I thank you very much. And remember, if you want to submit a question to Bok Talk, you can go to welcome to chickenlandia.com, go to the contact section and ask your chicken question. And you can also sign up for my mailing list. Then you will be a part of Chickenlandia Nation, which is the coolest chicken club in the universe. <laughs> It's true. Uh, so I want to, uh, well, I don't think I had any moderators today, but I do want to thank my co-producer, Kelsey Paulus. She's also known as the Chickenlandia Presidential Advisor. Uh, thank you for helping me to produce this episode. Thank you to Talking Crows for editing this episode and to Double M Ranch for the wonderful podcast art. If you enjoyed this podcast, remember to rate and review it. That really helps me. It helps for Bok Talk to get seen and heard, which is what we want. But the main thing I want you guys to remember is that you are always welcome in Chickenlandia. Bye. Thank you.